My name is Işın Önol. I'm a curator based in New York City. I come from Turkey and uh, my work is generally in the intersection of art, human rights, social justice and community engagement. I work with uh, people, I collaborate a lot with artists, activists, social workers, other cultural workers to uh, create environments where we uh, create platforms for personal memories and uh, collective histories to uh, have artistic forms, to have a different uh, form of communication. My name is Mariana Hirsch and unlike my three interlocutors, I'm not an artist or a curator, I don't make things, but I teach and I write. I teach comparative literature and gender studies at Columbia University and I write books and I've I think I'm here because I've learned so much about the artists that I'm writing about. In recent years, I've worked about the memory of painful pasts from a feminist perspective and a global perspective to see how that pain from the past could be reframed, could be rethought, could be mobilized for a more hopeful future. I'm Maria Jose Contreras. I am originally from Chile. I am now based in New York and I'm a multidisciplinary artist. My work deals with issues in, of social justice, of memory. I've worked a lot about the memory in, of post-dictatorship in Chile. I use various formats from Levi's theater, testimonial theater, performance art, and sometimes also uh, participatory performances or urban interventions. So my work aims to create the conditions to resonate together and to listen to each other and to cope with these difficult memories. My name is Adama Delphine Fawundu and I'm an interdisciplinary artist based in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I'm a first generation with parents from Equatorial Guinea and Sierra Leone. My work looks a lot at ancestral memory, indigenization, thinking about um, how do we activate our radical imaginations for something new and something different, a different way of being in this world, you know, for collective nature of humanity and understanding our own humanities. Mariana, we also collaborated a lot. Uh, you do make things and you're also a curator at the same time. That's true. But before perhaps diving into our topics, uh, particularly because this uh, talk is more about the intersection of art and human rights, and we are in such special times today, going through devastating and harrowing moments, uh, and we are witnessing something so strong. So I just thought it would be impossible not to a little bit start talking about what we are going through uh, before diving into our own works, perhaps. What do you think? Well, I'm glad that we have the space to talk to each other because I think that our work connects around these topics of injustice and of violent histories that keep repeating themselves and that we somehow need to interrupt. And I think the question for us today is, can art interrupt cycles of violence that are perpetuated by, the, by states and governments? For me, this is a very urgent question and a very, very painful moment because I'm the daughter of Holocaust survivors. And what I'm seeing now in the Middle East is horrible violence that's perpetrated against Jews and also by Jews. And I think I feel myself in a very difficult place to both acknowledge the brutality of attacks by Hamas and also the violence that's perpetrated right now on Gaza by the state of, by the Israeli current Israeli government, um, and how that connects to histories of colonization um, in the region. I think these are very difficult topics to tackle with, and uh, what art can do uh, when there is nothing seems possible to do is an, perhaps an important question. What I think is, I'm not sure if art can do something, but it can open spaces for us to speak from our individual positions, hearing perhaps personal stories, other than uh, repeating what is uh, uh, produced by states to us, and, and having a, perhaps a more global understanding of what is happening outside of these communities that are experiencing directly this violence. Perhaps this could be one of the uh, possibilities that we could create in our artistic uh, platforms, I guess. Yes, I believe that from one perspective, when lives are 
being lost and when people are being killed. It's difficult to think or imagine the role of art, but I do believe that art, of course, not necessarily does something like in concrete in terms of the crisis, but it does, as you say, like open spaces. And for me, something that I find valuable about artistic practices is the fact that it allows us somehow to hold visions, different visions, and to embrace uh, and to create spaces for listening to each other at a personal, uh, at a personal level. So, for instance, I work with performance art because there are some atrocities like that I don't think we can actually talk about. Like words are just not enough to talk about what's going on. Uh, I'm driving it to my own work uh, as someone that was born in the dictatorship in Chile. Uh, for instance, I uh, convoked this uh, urban intervention called Querer No Ver uh, that was trying to commemorate the detenidos desaparecidos. And talking about the detenidos desaparecidos, those that are missing in Chile, is so difficult. It's a par paradoxical state. Uh, and when we speak about it, it's like words are just not, uh, cannot render like that atrocity. So for me, like proposing a collective urban intervention is a way of uh, addressing these issues beyond like the spoken word and creating conditions for us to resonate, for affects to express in a way that's not like uh, necessarily like talking about it. And like today we see like most of the discourses about this terrible crisis are like slogan driven in social media or they are like driven by governments. Uh, and so art can offer another way of connecting, I guess, that's not word driven necessarily. Yes, I agree. I think that art is a way of language making and space making and sharing perspectives, various perspectives that individuals go through um, within the spaces. Like I think about um, also the idea that even like looking at my own heritage as someone who is from Sierra Leone and Equatorial Guinea, I use those nations, but what gets flattened by the nations are the people, right? So I am Mende. My dad was Mende, my mother was Bube. Those are whole existences that goes beyond national identities, but those were flattened through colonialism and that's what gets erased and then humanity gets erased. So with my work, it's really important to go into indigenization and think about a worldview that functions outside of the Western construct, which continues violence and um, think about other ways to commune with each other and with the earth. Um, I use a lot of video in my work. I slow it down. My videos are all in slow motion because I think that when you see something in slow motion, you get to sit for a long while and just take in. You take in the trees blowing. You take in the people moving slow. I have a video called The Cleanse where it's literally transforming my hair straightened hair into its natural state through water. That's a metaphor for transformation, but it's also a metaphor for understanding, well, at least trying to understand who we are at our core as humans and being comfortable with that. And understanding that there is a way, just coming from an identity such as mine, I was raised in American schools to literally hate who I am. And to think that you know the words used to describe my cultures were dehumanizing, and so internalizing that could then have me just you know it's like I'm not even a human being anymore. So my work is about changing that narrative, right? And I feel like if we start to look at some of these identities that have been flattened by colonialism and all of these atrocities understand the humanity in diversity, in extreme diversity, then we could begin to even start to think about, you know, when we're in situations that we're in now, we could start to look at people for being people and not just, you know, um, carnage or, you know, the people who suffer because of all of these other things. We could look at people as actual people and have some empathy. So that's really what I'm interested in, you know, with my work.
So what you said resonates with me a lot in terms of uh, when we think about human rights, we often forget about what we mean by human. Mm -hmm. And in many societies, we have this problem of uh, this injustice, inequalities. And uh, when you work with communities, this is where I find myself very lucky to to work with uh, communities in multiple projects, where I often see is that there are always silenced others within those communities. We often take those communities or social groups uh, for granted. We think there is some sort of a definition, some sort of a history of that community, but there are always hidden histories within, within those histories. And, um, and these works that allows uh, oral histories and personal stories to come out also allow us to hear those voices that are often silenced. I've spent a lot of my career writing, reading books with students, writing books and articles, uh, and the, having very word-driven discussions. And what I found in recent years is the, the kinds of collaborations and collaborative groups and working groups that I've been engaged in um, Women Mobilizing Memory and the Zip Code Memory Project, for example, bringing together artists, activists, and scholars creates a very different conversation and also a form of intervention. Bringing together these three groups in global ways and as feminists who are dedicated to working on social justice in different parts of the globe creates yet another very different kind of conversation. So I've learned that words can't do everything, and that having a space of looking together, of making things together, of creating a space where feelings and affects can emerge is a very different way to experience these painful histories that we all have inherited. So these groups have been enormously helpful for me also in thinking further, uh, but I've learned that thinking in words can't do everything. And that's why the arts have, I think, elicited a kind of vulnerability, not just in artists, but in artists and spectators in which we're all actively engaged with each other, where we can feel things and then move forward in ways that we might not even be able to articulate as we do. Yes, I agree. And I think that part of this of the fact of providing like another language that's a worthless one language or that combines words with other types of making and processes uh, is to slow down time. And this goes back to what you were talking about in your video. I think that somehow we live in a world that's full of noise, like social media, media, uh, discourse, pol political driven discourses. And just art and particularly this participatory practices allow us to find time. And that is so important, uh, not only to be able to listen to each other, but also to step a little bit out of the situations and, and maybe, hopefully, not only react, but also being able then to think together about what's going on. And I think that that also speaks to our current situation in terms of how art may eventually give us that distance and slow us down uh, to offer the time to reflect about what's going on and not only to react and to do that together. Like I think that's like such a crucial part of what I understand uh, my, my art practice is, like to, uh, to build that togetherness in a way that's uh, corporeal, bodily centered, uh, affect centered, <laughs> uh, and that allows other types of, uh, it immobilizes other types of actions and understandings. We don't all live in a bubble. Mm -hmm. That our actions have consequences for, mm. for others. We're all connected, mm. so we all have our responsibility. Ourselves into everyone. Mm. I love that um, that you mentioned the idea. Both of you are mentioning the ideas of collaboration, which I feel is so important, and it is a way that artists are working in, you know, with community, which is central. Um, I think a lot. My background: I taught in New York City public schools for ten years, and that is something that you don't see 
in the work directly, but it's embedded in the work. One of the things that really um, stood out to me as a public school teacher was the way that the curriculum is designed. Um, there's this erasure that takes place and a way that um, certain histories are, again, there's a hierarchy in the way that the story is told. And I think about the idea that so everyone has to go to school, right? Unless you're doing homeschooling or something, everyone, it's by law that you need to go to school. And I think about how that shapes the way that people see themselves, the way that they interact with each other. And I think an artist creating spaces to break that pattern is very important, but you think about what's going on in our society today. It is a huge um, topic right now about what books get banned, you know? Mm -hmm. How do we talk about histories? And I feel it's so important, that, you know, when we think about human rights, like to think about education and how our young people are affected and the role that artists could play in disrupting that. Um, I did a book, it's called um, um Fun Women Photographers of the African Diaspora. And I felt it necessary to make that book. It includes women and non-binary um, photographers, but I felt it necessary to add that book to the archive because I felt like even my voice as a photographer or as a maker in this space, um, it's, 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 there's a fear of erasure, like you could do something and then it's like you never did it, right? Or there are people who are looking for, this, for these histories and looking for these stories to inspire them and they can't find it. So after making our book, um, I made it with a, a co-author, Leila Amatula Bahrain. After making the book, I had tons of people emailing me saying, thank you, I had no idea about this, about these stories. So it goes back to the idea of lifting, um, lifting community, unfolding, the stories are there, right? But unpacking those stories and sharing, and um, even when those stories are not coming from your particular history, making room, opening doors, and let the, the, there's a saying that the circle, let the circle be unbroken, right? Let the circle be wide and inclusive in, in a real way. Yeah, so I think um, artists really, and I know we all do, think about that as we make space for each other, even when we, and being available to listen, as you were saying, and to hear and to see each other, you know, and, and, and to educate ourselves. The subject of schooling and photography yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, is a great opening for me to tell you a little bit about a project that I've been involved in, and it started out as a book and it ended up as an exhibition, and it's on school photos, mm -hmm. class photos. We all have them. No one's really paid attention to them because they're so conventional. They all look the same. You line up a bunch of kids and they face the camera, they're smiling. But the insight that we had, and this is a book and exhibition that I worked on together with Leo Spitzer, who's a historian. The insight that we had is that schooling, public schooling, and the development of photography coincided in the middle of the 19th century and that institutions and states used not only schooling but also school photography to integrate vastly diverse populations and to create a citizenry uh, through not just through pedagogies but also through photographs that would then instantiate that but that these objects these school photos which are not as much for the children, but for the institution to advertise itself, could also be used not just as inclusive institutions, but also to exclude and have separate schooling. So we found um, vernacular fo school photos from the very beginnings of the history of photography. 1865, I think, is one of the first ones in colonial schools, in schools, boarding schools for indigenous American um, students, and in European schools that try to integrate, have more you know, inclusive in integrated schools that uh, brought, in which empires and states brought together their diverse populations. So these are not very interesting objects, and you might think like, what is there to say about that? How we learn that there's a lot to say about it is to see artists who've taken these and have learned to disrupt the institutional gaze, to have, you know, some, somehow allow us to look at them in a, with a disobedient gaze 
to see how these institutions frame children, fix children into certain civic positions and how you could break the, unfix them somehow and make us look at them differently. So to expose the injustices, to expose um, the uh, differences that are being erased um, through these images. And we wrote this book, School Photos in Liquid Time, but then we thought we really need to put these artists' images and the vernacular images and the images from Europe, from Africa, from India, from um, the United States in conversation with each other. And a gallery space is really seemed like the really good way to do that. And we uh, curated an exhibition at the Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth College. So doing it in an institutional, um, in a public, in, a, in an educational institution seemed also like a good way to stage a dialogue um, about what, not just what education can do, but what a medium like photography could do and not do. So that was um, a really fun project to do as a literature professor, to be a curator. And uh, I learned tremendous amounts from uh, what it means to hang work on the wall or put it in cases and have people walk through and look rather than read your words. These sort of erasures don't always happen uh, based on historical uh, facts but also happens right in front of us when the events are happening. Right today, whatever is happening between certain political groups, there are um, personal experiences of violence that get erased uh, right in front of us. And these kind of encounters through our artistic projects also allow us to hear what is currently happening, what is currently getting erased right in front of us, what does not reach into the, the public knowledge, to media, etc. And um, one of our ongoing projects or, or long-term project, uh, Women Mobilizing Memory, that we worked uh, together with, um, allowed me to see not only within certain communities, certain social groups, but in larger groups where um, People came from Argentina, Cuba, um, other countries in South America, Middle East, Europe and the United States, the North America, how experiences of political violence were, had certain similarities or certain parallelities, how resistance against that, especially from the uh, feminist lens, uh, was very important to meet. Uh, and we could also see how the politics of erasure was happening in a very similar way and through very similar strategies. Uh, so um, the, looking at the history, what gets erased, also teach us how these formulations of erasures happens right in front of us as well. We also worked together on the Zip Code Memory Project yes. and maybe we could say a few words about that. So I, I think we've talked about how we've worked in you know, working groups across the globe and with our, you know, histories that are from so many different countries. But when the COVID pandemic started, uh, we were all in our very lo present locations and our present location is New York City. And we somehow, the inequalities in that have been, that are structurally embedded in the geography of this city somehow became so blatantly obvious that they could no longer be ignored. You only had to look at the zip code map to see how those inequalities structure our geography and our social life. And the Zip Code Memory Project was an, an effort to try to address these inequalities through the arts and to provide a space where people who had been isolated for a year and a half of the pandemic could come together and to imagine how we could reform our zip codes of spaces of togetherness rather than our, of separation. So we had a number of art and performance projects, but also an exhibition curated by Ishin that brought artists from across, around the city, but also other parts of the world together to mark this moment, this moment of tremendous loss that we somehow even now have not really processed because there's not enough space to mourn all the people we've lost 
and not enough space to rebuild or to build a community. Within the Zipco Memory Project, um, I did a performance, a durational performance that was called Talk to the Future. Uh, and the idea about that performance came out from the workshops. We did several workshops with people that lived in this zip codes. Uh, and one day I remember like one woman telling me, uh, I can't round up my head about what happened and I don't know how I will tell my grandson uh, what happened, how I will pass on to him this story. Uh, so that made me think about how well, when we are in a crisis or a catastrophe as the COVID pandemic, we are so much into it that we don't have the time, the slowness uh, or the openness to think about what was going on. So I created this performance that's uh, it's called Talk to the Future and it's a time capsule. So I have this uh, transparent bubble. Uh, it was yeah, a, a, a tent, a transparent tent, where I invited people to come in. I was in the bubble for more than 60 hours. Uh, so, and I, I transferred the bubble in different uh, places around Europe. So people would come in and I would just ask them, what do you think that future generations should know about COVID? And people start telling me uh, many, most of them were surprised about the question because uh, they, most of them wanted to talk about their experience with COVID. That was like a past experience. Uh, but the question about the future uh, really opens up and kind of makes a shift in the experience of the pandemic. So I would listen to what they had to say, sometimes one minute, sometimes 10 minutes, sometimes 40 minutes. And then I would start writing, verbatim on my transparent capsule what people told me. So this capsule that was at the beginning transparent, completely transparent is now full of the stories and memories and visions about the future uh, of many, many different people. So I think that that goes back to our initial question about what art can do. I think that we, it's, we are usually trapped in repeating the cycles of violence and suffering from the past. So the background and the past really waits on our shoulders and art sometimes can create uh, an openness to imagine a different future and to think together about how we can continue uh, after a crisis as the COVID pandemic or after uh, this massive violation of human rights that are happening now in Gaza, for instance. So how can we together hope for a different future, tune our hope and imagine uh, another way of living together.